All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here. This is my second time at uh, SAS Talk, which makes sense because it's only been happening twice. Uh, I've been told if anyone has questions while I'm talking, hey, I just realized I don't have a clicker. Does anyone have a clicker for me? Um, yeah, I've been told if, if you have questions, just go to Slido and lo log your questions there, and um, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Thank you. I assume green is forward. All right. Beautiful. So I'm here today to talk about uh, scaling strategies for SaaS companies that sell to SME, so the small and mid-size uh, business market. I'll do a very brief introduction to myself. I'm going to talk about uh, the SME market, talk about the challenges in selling to SMEs, and some of the tactics that I've seen work over the years in selling to SMEs. First of all, who here... Uh, is part of a SaaS company that sells to the small and mid-sized enter enterprise market. Almost everyone, perfect. Everyone else, you can go. This is not relevant for you. Beautiful, okay, quick intro. So as I said, my name is Mark McLeod. I've been in the venture-backed startup world since the late uh, 1990s. I spent uh, 14 years as CFO for a number of VC-backed startups, most notably uh, Shopify and FreshBooks. Also spent three years as a general partner at uh, Canada's largest and most active seed stage venture fund where I was investing primarily in uh, SME SAS companies. Um, you can't tell from my accent, but I'm actually Scottish and I lived in Scotland for 11 years, so I'm really happy to be on uh, this side of the pond again. I now run um, a company called SurePass Capital Partners. So we are a boutique investment bank. We raise growth capital for companies. We exit companies. We have a very deep focus on uh, SME SaaS companies. We, uh, our headquarters are in Toronto, Canada, and we have an office in San Francisco as well. Um, perfect segue from the last panel where folks were talking about coming into the US. A big part of our value to European companies is helping them either raise capital in the US or ultimately get bought in the US. Uh, what I've seen over the years is that um, most of the buyers tend to be North American, and the big outcomes from any part of the world at some point end up having U.S. institutional investors on the cap table. So that's a big part of why I'm here. It's not just for the Guinness. Um, just a couple of deals that we've closed. We've been closing about a deal a quarter. I uh, won't spend any time on that. And. Uh, uh, get into SME, as I said, we, we have a really simple goal for our firm, which is to be the leading uh, advisor, the leading boutique investment bank to the global SME software market. Uh, we have very deep relationships with all the buyers of those companies and all the investors who look at those kinds of companies, and SME is the market that we love the most, which is perfect segue into our talk. So let's talk about SME. So this is... Um, this is US data, but I think kind of the breakdown here applies across geographies. There are 30 million small businesses in the US alone, uh, 60 million in the English speaking countries, and 600 million globally. And as you can see, the vast majority of them, kind of 91% in the US anyway, uh, tend to be pretty small. And uh, that trend, I think, is, is similar across markets. We see a, a few trends that are kind of driving. As I said, it's already a, a massive market, as you can tell, right? 30 million folks, 30 million businesses in the US alone. But it's actually growing a lot more uh, in the coming years. And that's why we're really excited about this market. And it's growing really for a couple of, I guess, a couple of macro trends that we see. One is a change in the nature of work. It's increasingly rare for people to you know, graduate from university and join some big company and go work there for the rest of their lives. People are wanting more meaning, more authenticity, more flexibility, and they're choosing to work for themselves either in whole or in part. The other is just a change in demographics. Um, again, I don't have a European stat for this, but in the US, every single day, 10,000 people turn 65. And so what you're seeing, that obviously spans, that's not just entrepreneurs, that's everyone, but what you're seeing is a, just a turnover in entrepreneurial demographics, where older generations of entrepreneurs were very happy to run their businesses on pen and paper and Word and Excel, but the new generation, the people in this room, absolutely will not. They're gonna look on their phone first, and if they don't find what they like there, they're gonna look on their desktop browser, they're gonna find something and try it. And so whether it's front office software or back office, we see just many, many categories of software that are gonna go through big growth as a result of these, these two trends. 
And the last thing I'll say here is that unlike kind of consumer and enterprise software, which tend to be winner takes all or winner takes most kind of market dynamics, in SME software, it's so fragmented that there's always room for new players. And similarly, there's always room to, to consolidate. Uh, just one example. So prior to launching SurePath, I ran finance, biz dev, and corp dev for FreshBooks. Uh, we competed with Intuit. Um, you know, there's 30 million small businesses in the US. Intuit had a three-decade head start. And they had 7 million of those 30 million small businesses. So it's not nothing, but it's not the kind of near monopoly that you see in other market segments. So that's just, uh, just a little overview of the SME market. And given that most of you in this room uh, cater to that market, hopefully I was kind of preaching to the choir there. So let's talk about some of the challenges that you see when, uh, when catering to small business. This is from uh, Jason Lemkin, Mr. Saster. Um, he says that you know, SMBs churn at a very high rate, and so you're usually forced to go up market finding larger customers. But if you can get the math to work, then that's when the magic happens and some of the biggest outcomes are in SME. So that's just setting the stage. So churn is uh, the single most important metric in any recurring revenue business. Uh, that applies to enterprise, consumer, uh, and SME. So this is just a, a really simple illustration of the impact of churn. Just take a cohort of 100K of monthly recurring revenue and look what happens to it over time at different churn rates. If you're churning at 5% a month, that very quickly goes down to nothing. Whereas on the flip side, if you can have even modest negative revenue churn, then you have a growing annuity. So that cohort just keeps growing in value in time. And that is when investors kind of back up the Brinks truck and ask you how much money they can give you because you have a really valuable asset. This is what I've seen over the years in SMB. And, and here's the thing, SMB incorporates, again, selling to like freelancers and all the way up to kind of 500 person businesses, but closer to the low end, more the S than M. This is what I've seen kind of work over time in terms of best in class unit economics, you know, kind of a two, two and a half percent logo churn, which equates to kind of keeping a customer for about four years and where you pay no more than a quarter of that customer's lifetime value on a fully loaded basis. So kind of programs and sales and marketing bodies. Uh, so it gives you a four to four X LTV to CAC ratio. So let's talk now about uh, scaling strategies. I'm kind of blasting through this, but, um, and you know, these are kind of seven strategies that I've seen kind of work over time uh, to really build a big company when you sell to SME. You know, product is super important, but most of the value in your startup's journey will be created through distribution, through finding customers, through getting kind of large amounts of revenue. And if you're venture funded, you know, your VCs often will push you to kind of move up market and chase larger customers and hire ARPU. And the thing about SME is if you can just tough it out and kind of leverage one or more of these channels, then over time you can, you can build a really large business. Um, so let's kind of go into each strategies. And I should mention, none of these are mutually exclusive, obviously. You know, it's not like you pick one and that's your strategy, but you know, different strategies apply either kind of either different stages in the company life cycle, kind of different segments of the market, et cetera. So the first one is to have a low cost of acquisition. That is usually driven by some kind of viral loop. Uh, so companies that come to mind include kind of Dropbox, where if you refer folks, you get kind of more and more space. SurveyMonkey and MailChimp, right? You either fill out a survey or you receive an email newsletter and you think, hey, that's a really cool tool, I'll sign up. You know, Typeform is a more modern example of that. And what, what I've seen with these kind of viral loop driven um, business models is they tend to have, there's a period where it feels like it's kind of going super slow and then suddenly boom, there's this inflection point and it, and it shoots up. And you see that with kind of Dropbox user growth where it was flat for a while and then it just took off. And if I had a graph of LinkedIn's kind of network user base over time, it would be the exact same pattern. So um, creating viral hooks in your product to turn recipients, you know, users of your, your users into your users, 
that's confusing. In any event, viral hooks is uh, one strategy. Second, and uh, not unrelated, is freemium. Where you, and there's kind of two flavors of freemium. One is the product's entirely free, and it's monetized indirectly, usually through advertisements. And then the second is where you have, again, a free-based product, but then there's uh, basically incentives or, you know, those most engaged users are going to basically convert and become paid subscribers over time. Um, freemium was super hot a few years ago, and then folks were like, hey, it's actually really hard to make freemium work. I can't get the math to work. I still think it has a role to play, but there are certain prerequisites for freemium to work in my books. One, you know, very, very large market. Second, the incremental cost to serve each of those free users is near zero. And uh, third, you know, very kind of differentiated upgrade path so that your most uh, engaged users will just naturally become paid customers. Uh, so there's lots of comp examples of companies who do that. Again, MailChimp, uh, SurveyMonkey, DocSend that's here, just a bunch of companies. Strategy three, this is a busy slide, but uh, cross-selling products. So the thinking here is you kind of just tough it out for a bunch of years with one product and then get enough scale that you can either build products or buy other companies and, and, and get new products that you can cross-sell to that same customer base. Uh, GoDaddy is the quintessential example and the largest probably kind of pure SMB SaaS company that sells multiple products. You probably think of them as a domain name provider, but they do a whole bunch of other things. They are the largest reseller of Microsoft Office Online globally. They have about seven different products that they resell. You know, HubSpot was a one product company for a lot of, of its history, but then it had enough scale that it could, you know, build new products. It's become an active acquirer now as well. And same thing for, for Zendesk. So it's not something you want to do when you're just starting up because you don't have the scale, you don't have the resources. You know, not all of your customers on product one are going to buy product two, so you need a big enough base that you can cross-sell. But over time, as you get bigger, you know, cross-selling is a, a very viable strategy. Number four, build a channel. You know, there's only so far that direct response marketing goes before your incremental cost of, you know, acquiring that nth customer just becomes really high and starts to approach the lifetime value of that customer. And so you need to start thinking about building channels. And again, if you do it really early, it's probably tough because no one else wants to sell your product. It's hard enough for you to sell your product. So kind of not at the beginning, but more kind of once your product is established, there's clear product market fit, you've got some kind of brand awareness, that's when you start thinking about building a channel. Again, HubSpot is an example here. They have agency partners who bring in about a third of their revenue. Um, and then the big accounting software guys, like, you know, Zero, Zero's main go-to-market strategy is through accountants. They go and give accountants a whole bunch of practice management tools and, like, here, run your business on Zero, and then go and convert all of your clients onto Zero. And so you'll see for every accountant you get, you may get kind of 5, 10, 15, you know, fresh new customers. So a lot of leverage there. Number five, uh, give great customer support. This is sort of a counterintuitive one. Many uh, companies think that they cannot afford to give great service when they sell to small business because the customers are so small. But here's the thing, you know, um, first of all, small business owners, they're super stretched, they have no time, um, they don't have an IT department, they, and the other thing is, is they, they talk to each other, right? So if you give great uh, customer support, they tell their peers, they tell their friends, and that kind of just leads to kind of more customers. So at FreshBooks, um, this is really a core part of the culture. Every single person in the company, no matter how junior or senior, introvert or extrovert, spends the first 30 days of their life as a FreshBooks employee in customer support, you know, picking up the phone, responding to email, learning the product, learning the culture. When you call customer support at FreshBooks today, if the phone is not picked up in three rings, literally every single phone in the office will ring until someone serves that customer. So what that has bred over the years is just an insane customer first culture and a very high net promoter score at Apple level territories. And a high NPS just gives you so much leverage for your marketing because there's just so much kind of free love that's coming in.
So something to think about there. Um, next is to add payments. So this is not going to apply to all software categories, but anything that's kind of, well, you see front office examples like Shopify, you know, I'm going to run a store and now I need to collect payments. You're going to see back office examples like Xero and FreshBooks where I send an invoice and now I want you to pay me. You see it with vertical specific applications like MindBody where I can open up a yoga studio and you know, collect payments online. But for a small business owner, kind of, there's only so much they're willing to pay for software. But the payments uh, piece kind of psychologically comes out of a different pocket. And so you add it together and it can actually add up to kind of meaningful revenue. And so it's hard to see here, but the graph at the bottom is Shopify's quarterly revenue. And over time, you know, the merchant services, that's their payments offerings, is now 50% of the business or a little bit more actually as of today. And if they had just stuck with software, their, their growth really would have tapped out. But because they've added payments, they're now a company that's worth over $10 billion. So not saying if you add payments, you're going to be worth $10 billion. Don't quote me on that. But you know, for many businesses, adding a payments product is uh, super important. And from that small business customer's point of view, the thing they care about the most, well, it's two things. One is finding customers, but second, kind of getting paid on time. And so having a payments offering is actually super valuable. Strategy seven, segmentation. So remember earlier I said there were 30 million small businesses. If you try and, if you have built a product that you think is applicable to all 30 million small businesses, you've really built something that's applicable to no one. You know, no business owner just thinks of themselves as, I am a small business owner. They think of themselves as whatever industry they're in. I'm a plumber, I'm a dentist, I'm a doctor, whatever. And so, you know, the best SaaS companies, and ironically, some of the biggest, have started out and spent a meaningful amount of their history being super narrow and focused on serving one customer or one vertical. And, you know, FreshBooks, again, today, I keep going back to that just because I know it well, only thinks about five verticals. And if there's customers that come in from elsewhere, that's fine. But, you know, they're, when they are thinking about product decisions, thinking about messaging, thinking about marketing channels, events, whatever, they're only thinking about it through kind of the lens of a, a small number of verticals. So just kind of some lessons learned over time uh, from scaling SME SaaS. The first is business owners have no time, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And um, I think that kind of has implications for how you build products for SME SaaS. With uh, AI and machine learning kind of getting more and more reliable, I think you have the opportunity to build these black boxes that just kind of do one thing really well, and I as a business owner can just trust it, and off I go. Or on the flip side, have a complex product that is supported by services that either you provide or an ecosystem around you provides. You see that with Shopify, where they have people who can build and design your stores. You see that with Squarespace, where you have website builders who can you know, take a template and then customize it for you. The commonality there, kind of one extreme, you know, a pure AI or two software with managed services is still I as a business owner do not have to spend time in the product because I don't have that time. Uh, so that's, that's an important thing. Um, second, you know, growing super fast is, is actually expensive. Um, SME is a huge market, but it tends to grow at a certain rate. There are three million new businesses started every year. Uh, some number of those have a common set of needs. They need a domain, they need uh, email marketing, they need accounting software, so on and so on. But if you try and grow at kind of 2x or 3x the natural growth rate in your market, then your incremental cost of acquisition kind of goes way up. And this is the challenge probably that many of you feel when you're dealing with early stage VCs who want you to 3x your business every year. And um, I was talking to uh, a CEO today you know, where we agreed that kind of in SME, like it's great to raise some initial capital, but then you actually have this sort of desert you have to cross between kind of 1 million and 10 million ARR where you're not growing fast enough to be really appealing to the VCs, which is often why they try and get you to move up market. But kind of 10 million ARR beyond, you get into more growth stage private equity territory where, again, your business won't grow 3x a year, but it could probably grow 50 to 75% a year 
more or less in perpetuity because many categories of SME software have been around for a long time and they're going to be around for a long time. So thinking about the natural growth rate in your market and then thinking about how long you know, the opportunity you have to build your company and just aligning that to the capital that you bring in, that's kind of really the point here. Third point really is around net promoter score. I've talked about that with the FreshBooks example. Do not underestimate it. I think it's a critical metric. Invest in kind of getting, you know, real customer love. And, um, you know, help your customers grow. And what I mean by this is, again, if I go back to the two things that a, an entrepreneur cares about most, it's finding customers and then getting paid by those customers. So if you have built a product that helps me save time, like, eh, I don't really care. Whereas you've built a product that's going to help me grow my business, I, I care a lot. Um, last thing is, and this goes back to my point about evergreen markets, you know, good things just take time. If you think about some of the biggest SME software companies, they've been around for a long time. Zoho's been around for since 1996, Basecamp and SurveyMonkey, you know, 1999 and, and so on. You don't have, you know, if you read kind of TechCrunch all the time, then you think like, Inside three years, you're gonna sell your business for $300 million. Sometimes that happens, more often than not, it doesn't. And you know, with SME in particular, you really do have an opportunity to just hunker down and build a very meaningful business, but over decades, not years. That's it, thank you very much. I think we're out of time, but if, if there's questions up on the board, I'm happy to take them. Sweet.